Okay, let's reconvene then for our second session of today, looking at the interpretation of Paul's Dekai O language, Dekai O language. And we have uh, two papers uh, for this session, um, one from Doug himself, and then a response from Scott. And we're very glad that uh, Scott has come from St. Andrews to this uh, session, and we are looking forward to your, your input and to the discussion that follows. We're hoping for this session that obviously we want to hear an exchange between Douglas and uh, Scott, but we're also hoping that we'll have more time for uh, wider contributions from the um, audience. So, um, so with that in mind, we will get quickly to business, and I'll ask Doug to give his presentation. Thanks, Douglas. Well, there won't be an acting performance taking up valuable plenary time. So thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much, Scott, for taking this on at short notice. I very much appreciate the time and effort that you've put uh, into coming here and look forward to your comments. Um, this is my final paper. So let's rock and roll. Um, we've just considered one way that a destructive foundationalism can be unleashed into our broader accounts of Paul's thinking about salvation. This is through the forward construal of the argument in Romans 1 to 3. That construal will release foundationalism in the specific form, of course, of Western contractualism, although it may form an alliance with a more general commitment on the part of Paul's interpreters to a fundamentally rationalistic and moralistic an invariably quite individualizing anthropology, a, co a conception of the human person that primarily governs itself, which is, needless to say, deeply congenial to modern thought and culture. Now, this type of anthropology will lead Paul's interpreters to read him forward as well, as an essentially autonomous individual sets off on a quest for salvation, driven and governed by her own conceptions. This is kind of a Bultmanian type of agenda. These two moves, foundationalist reading of Paul, individual, individualistic kind of Cartesian anthropology, perhaps operating in tandem, will unleash this virulent conditionality and contractualism within Paul, although an alternative reading of Romans 1 to 3, if that's plausible, in non-foundationalist Socratic terms, will counter this eventuality, thereby closing down one important point of access for Paul's distortions. It is this front that I'm seeking to close off with an alternative reading of Romans 1 to 3. However, winning this battle will unfortunately not win the war. Uh, contractual foundationalism, in my experience, can corrupt Paul's thought in two other ways, principally. Through a conditional account of Paul's faith language, which will then retroject conditionality into his account of the problem, and through a particular construal of the Apostle's dikaio terms, uh, things like dikaiosune, dikaio, dikaios, and so on. These may be viewed as informed fundamentally, like Western society, by a certain notion of justice that is understood in turn in terms of a narrative of retribution. Um, as well as with the appropriate correlative meta metaphors, George Lakoff would remind us of things like equivalence and straightness and proportionality. And this will release Western conditionality in Paul's thinking again. Both these Aryan interpretive projects must be countered if the Athanasian gospel is ever to emerge from Paul clearly. So, we'll address the struggle surrounding Paul's faith terminology momentarily. And for now, we'll concentrate on the struggle surrounding the interpretation of his Dikaio language. And I'm going to need to do two things here. So this will be another two-front battle. I need to offer a suitable account of the relatively rare but strategic noun phrase, Dikaio Sune Theu, that started to come up in the last session. It's usually rendered as the righteousness of God. Obviously, I need to provide an account of the cognate verb, dikaio, which is usually translated justify, I justify. After these two moves, I think the dikaio data will take care of itself. So, I need to provide accounts of these two data points that don't introduce inappropriate Western notions of justice into Paul's texts at the lexicographical level. I made some suggestions in deliverance about how I was going to do this. So that's basically what I'm gonna do in this paper talk about what I did with the Kaiosune Theu, 
and then talk about what I did with Dikai Uh-oh. I haven't had a lot of feedback on this because I think people are completely worn out by the time they reach chapter 18, 19, 20 of Deliverance. <laughs> they just want it to stop. Um, but we get to talk about it for an hour or two. Okay, so the meaning of Dikai Asune Theu. As perhaps Gadamer has emphasized most clearly, we all approach texts with a network of presuppositions without which we simply cannot make sense of them. This certainly holds for our convictions about ontology or being. So may I suggest at the outset that informed ultimately by the Trinity, I'm thinking in particular of a work by Jungel, we assume that being, and especially divine being, is fundamentally active and dynamic. So we should vigilantly resist any dichotomy in our thinking between being and act or activity. These realizations will help us straight away when we try to understand what Paul was getting at when he used this phrase, to kaya sune theu. Now, many scholars in the past have worried at the outset about the genitive that's used here. Is it subjective, authorial, objective? Cranfield runs through five possibilities. What I want to suggest is, given a dynamic understanding of ontology or being, any reference to a divine attribute or aspect of being must simultaneously be a reference to divine activity and hence to something both inherent in and proceeding from God. At which point, if we commit too strongly to one of these genitives, we will actually fail to capture Paul's meaning. A dynamic being breaks through these categorizations, we might say. Uh, and the same applies to our Dikaya Sunni, or righteousness. This must be an ongoing, righteous, uh, ongoing dynamic state of right behavior or activity. Uh, I think it can be activity or it can be an act. A righteous act, righteous activity, which makes me a righteous person. Same kind of thing. Alert to this ontological dynamism and to the treachery of certain Western interpretive distinctions, I suggest we turn first to the internal evidence of Paul's actual texts. I'm going to make this suggestion for two reasons, one again involving possible treachery. This is a story of treachery, this paper. In the past, scholars have often approached the meaning of Dikaio Sune Theu by way of long histories of scholarship and of the broad lexical data. Vast surveys of Old Testament usage are not uncommon, but such surveys need to be handled carefully. Strictly speaking, such analyses establish a spectrum of semantic possibilities for Paul's phrase, different options at the level of the signified when we try to interpret the Greek signifiers. The signifier is what we've got in the text, the signified is what we're after, and we have different possibilities. Such surveys also provide information about contextual activators, what Umberto Eco calls denotations and connotations, and these would lead us to affirm particular semantic options if they're present. So properly use such data is invaluable, although it's incomplete. We must still attend carefully to Paul's texts to try to discern which meaning from within the available spectrum provided by our survey is in play, if we can, in relation to which activators, if they're present. The internal evidence is always decisive, but we should attend to it for one further reason. Unfortunately, much of the survey material is gripped by a methodological fallacy James Barr exposed some time ago. He talked about etymologism, in which words are supplied with some kernel or essence of meaning that supposedly holds over time. And then this essence can perhaps be detected in a survey of a science historical antecedents and introduced after this into its current textual location, illegitimately, of course. A theological agenda is often thereby introduced, perhaps subliminally, into the selections and commentary that inevitably inform a vast survey, and it can subsequently be insinuated into the Pauline data. This is a particularly egregious imposition because it takes place before the syntax and broader grammar of the texts has been processed, which this distorting prior decision tends to shape. It's consequently very difficult to correct this sort of lexicographical mistake once it's been made in the light of what Paul is actually saying. What I'm trying to say here is that people inject bad theology into Paul's texts at the level of the words. And then once they're in the words, you're, you're screwed, basically, because you can't get them out, because the words will dictate what, what the sentence says and what the, what the grammar says. Uh, so, so winkling it out of the actual, actual lexicography is a vital thing to try and do. 
And the only way I know of doing that is, is to push hard on the internal evidence and resist this kind of etymolo etymologizing move. And also we have to be presuppositionally transparent. We have to recognize when we're doing it. Okay, so I'm gonna to turn to this internal evidence in summary form. I suggest that Paul provides enough information and context, especially in certain revealing argumentative parallels, for us to construct a basic map of the signification of Dikaios Suno Theu, and one that falls well within the possibilities established by earlier surveys of the broader data. So, deliverance scans certain Pauline texts concluding that the Dikaios Suno Theu is an event. It is singular, it is saving, it is liberating, it is life-giving, it is resurrecting. So that's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah? A singular, saving, liberating, life-giving, resurrecting event. It's got to be good for you. Okay. Nothing here is very controversial, I hasten to add. This account basically corroborates the famous judgment of Ernst Kesemann's classic study, that the Dikaya Sunetheu is God's sovereignty over the world, revealing itself eschatologically in Jesus, leading to a saving gift with the characteristics of a power. And you know, at this point, I, I could rest my case. I think that's all I need. My reading's going to stay on track. Paul's going to be saying the right things. He's not going to be talking about retribution when he uses Dikaya Sunetheu. He's going to be talking about God doing something dramatic to save you, to reach you, to set you free. But I... Yes, I engaged in an act of repentance, all right, in, in deliverance that's attached to this. When I was writing deliverance up, up to the end of 2007, I returned to consider a suggestion made by Richard Hayes in his seminal book, Echoes of Scripture. And Hayes observed in that book, almost in passing, that elements of Psalm 98, Psalm 97 in the Septuagint, inform Paul's language in Romans 1.17. I was led at this moment to repent of my earlier churlish rejection of this proposal back in 1989 when I was writing my doctoral thesis. With a new sensitivity to such intertextual suggestions, possibly assisted by the fact that the suggester now had an office just down the corridor from mine, I realized that Hayes was right, although his proposal had yet to be argued for in detail. So I proceeded to try to do this. I won't reproduce that argument in full here, that's what I do in chapter 18 in Deliverance, but suffice it to say that there are all these echoes and illusions and stuff that get Psalm 98 in play. So I think it can be fairly firmly established that Hayes was right, and that there's an echo of the psalm which reads, the Lord has made known his salvation before the pagans, he's revealed his Dikaiosune. He's recalled his mercy to Jacob, to Jacob, his truth to the house of Israel, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Lovely text. But we should now advance beyond Hay's suggestion by recognizing that the psalm is a psalm of divine kingship. It rejoices as God draws near to rule the earth by his strong right arm. It is a he at this point. Consequently, Paul's use of Rome, uh, use in Romans of phraseology drawn from the psalm, as well as from other related texts, subtly evokes the discourse of divine kingship that runs through much of the Old Testament. And a quick reprise of that material reveals that much of it overlaps with the raw data of righteousness, but in a distinctive way. God is often described as a king when an appeal is being made to him to save his people. He's frequently being asked to rescue them from some extremity or thanked and praised when he has done so. Hence, when the Cairo language occurs in these contexts, it seems to confirm the classic study of the Cairo there by Hermann Kramer, which detected the saving dimension in a lot of the Cairo language in the Old Testament and in Paul. Now, he called it justitia salutifera, recognizing its differences from other customary, customary and arguably more Western ways of conceiving of justitia in terms of retribution. So once again, I think a classic German study of the question seems to have been right. But in the light of the surrounding discourse of kingship that informs this usage, we can now perhaps grasp a little more clearly than we did before how Paul can speak in these saving terms in Romans 1, 16 to 17 of something right happening. Hence the use of the word, hence using the word dikaiosune especially appropriately 
which is a signifier that often, not always, but often has this connotation of rightness. Okay, it is right for a king to save his people when they're in extremity. This is the appropriate ethical action for a ruler in relation to the rule that we sometimes hear spoken of today in an aristocratic vestige as noblesse oblige. Now, you will know what I'm talking about when I say this. Americans don't. Um, unfortunately, royam oblige. I actually quite like noblesse oblige because uh, it's way better than having a bunch of aristocrats running around that have no oblige. Trust me. You want to have it um, if that's your option. Um, okay, so the nature of the underlying relationship even demands this. A king, as a king, has responsibilities, as does a queen. And when he or she acts accordingly, this is right. And the same applies to the divine monarch. In situations of duress, something right is happening precisely in and as something saving happens. These two notions in this context, framed by this discourse, are coterminous, okay? So, here's the key point. Paul's phraseology is not conforming to some other standard of rightness at this point. There's no need to make that claim. The story of divine kingship that he evokes establishes the rightness of God's saving action in its own terms. Indeed, this divine act is now arguably the definition of rightness above all others, as Bart articulates so clearly in 4.1 of the Church Dogmatics. Um, in, in other words, by looking at what God is doing in Christ and understanding that in terms of a, a discourse of kingship, that shows us what, what rightness really is. And in the light of that, we evaluate all other forms of rightness and all other forms of justice. So it's the apocalyptic and then the retrospective move. So that's what I'm trying to say. That's what I think Paul is up to. It's also worth grasping in this relation that God's saving act, in a sense, resonates more in contemporary terms with an executive than with a judicial or forensic activity. So we don't want to mobilize the terminology of forensic or judicial language too quickly in this connection, uh, because a king was both a judge and an executive, and all these actions were encompassed by the Caius So we have to ask ourselves, ourselves which one is in operation. I, I would say Psalm 98 really harks back to ancient executive actions. I think it belongs to the same family of acts as the exodus, the conquest, the successful campaigns of the judges, the delivery of Jerusalem from the hand of the Assyrians, uh, the return from exile, uh, the saving acts of Israel's divine king. Okay, so it's misleading for modern readers to suggest that, Paul, that God's Dekaiosune and Paul suggests a judge unless that notion is carefully contextualized. God acting in this phrase like an ancient, God is acting in this phrase like an ancient king visiting executive judgment on his enemies and liberating his oppressed people. He's not like some modern presider over a court of appeals upholding due process. And in the light of all these realizations, we can perhaps grasp an interesting dimension in Paul's broader argument a little more precisely than is often the case one that will also be useful when we start talking about the verb in a few minutes. This is, this is, this is quite important. Um, precisely because of this compassionate and obligated sense of rightness in hearing in the identity of the divine king, people in the Old Testament appeal to it when they're in extremity. And at times they even make this appeal in the full knowledge that they've got no other basis for an appeal in terms of their own uprightness. But because God is their king, sinners can appeal to him for help. And that scenario comes up quite a lot. He should still hear their petition uh, and act to save them because of him, because of his character, not because of the character of the sinner. So it's especially intriguing to note that Paul quotes a text from this tradition in Romans as well, and Galatians, Psalm 143. Don't enter into judgment with your slave etc., etc. This quotation in Psalm, a part of the tradition that recognizes the sinfulness of the supplicant. The petition to God for help is rooted in, appeal, in an appeal to God's obligated righteousness. Lord, listen to my prayer. Hear me in your truth. Listen to me. Uh, sorry, hear my request in your truth. Listen to me in your righteousness. And I think that this further appeal to God's justitia salutifera is in play by way of an echo in Romans seems pretty likely 
in view of the fact that the very next verses in the letter foreground God's dikaiosine so decisively and overtly. However, in order to grasp the full significance of this connection for Paul's unfolding argument, we should take a final explanatory step and reintroduce the circumstances of Romans into our discussion. Now, nobody has a problem with Paul denying, uh, with, with, with Paul opposing someone in Galatians. And all I'm really suggesting is that the same should apply to Romans. Romans is best explained with these problematic guys wandering around. And we've got to ask ourselves, what is it that they're saying that's upsetting Paul so much? So here we need to probe that. We haven't done it yet. Paul objects deeply and strongly to the gospel proclaimed by these opponents who are probably Messianic Jews. They're unhappy with his abandonment of the Torah. I think they probably urged the importance of the Torah, rather like 4th Maccabees and Philo. And this is what they thought. Only the cutting off of the sinful passions through circumcision and subsequent, so, so the snip of flesh had, had very concrete ethical implications. It was literally an ethical surgery. Seems a little strange to us, but this is how this literature works. Obviously only works for guys, right? Don't know what girls do. Uh, but if you're a guy, you get to cut off your sinful passions with the snip, okay? And then you subsequently control your passions because your mind is instructed by the Torah, and this facilitates righteous behavior. But the snip and the pedagogy of the law does affect righteousness. So it's kind of a Jewish Aristotelianism. That's really what's, what, what's going on. And also, presumably, your transgressions get cleansed by the blood of the dying Messiah who replaces the, the temple cult. The result of a disciplined pursuit of all this, like an athlete in training, would be an appearance before the throne of God on Judgment Day and a firmly anticipated judgment of righteous, at which point those so affirmed could enter into the blessings and life of the age to come. This is where we're going. We're uh, elite athletes for God, trained in righteousness, and I think the teacher really did think ethical perfection was possible, so clearly he was a Methodist. Okay. But Paul is skeptical about the value of any of this, and on numerous grounds. We need to think about this for a minute. His principal problem seems to have been this alternative gospel's abandonment of the ethics supplied by God and Christ, seen on the one hand in its emphasis on a decisive future event, the verdict of the day of judgment, as against a decisive past event with present effect. Paul's not so worried about the future, he's worried about what's happened. And on the other hand, in its conditional and hence inevitably insecure and anxious saving arrangement, as against an unconditional salvation grounded in God's loving election. This alternative gospel just doesn't do very much with Jesus Christ and provides precious little assurance in Paul's view. That is to say, things must apparently be added to Christ before anyone is saved or can behave properly. And at this point, the loving character of God is called into question, and salvation is opened up to considerable insecurity. <clears throat> but God's gracious and radically saving provision in Christ has also revealed for Paul a hitherto unsuspected depth of human depravity which he narrates in terms of an Adamic story of demonic invasion and oppression. We get this in Romans 5, 7, 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm sure that this was a biographical move for Paul. I mean, um, I'm not someone that wants to make too much happen on the road to Damascus, but what we forget is that Paul was a violent man. He was uh, someone who killed, someone who beat people, someone who was happy to, to, to imprison, to punishment, uh, to punish, to incarcerate. And that pretty much goes from his writings. I mean, we don't notice Paul threatening to beat or cudgel or punish or kill people if they don't become Christians. But this is kind of what he was doing when he was a Jew. So some massive reversal has taken place. And, and what do you do when you turn around and go, gosh, all this incredible effort, this vigilance, this zeal, I mean, my, my, my preparedness to kill on your behalf turns out to have been your own stupid idea. I would say that you conclude that you are a fundamentally stupid person, uh, deeply depraved in the grip of sinful passions that can twist and distort your, think distort your thinking. So this is kind of an Augustinian reading of Paul, but I think it's right. In the light of this unpleasant disclosure, 
Paul, so he loses his confidence in his own human nature and the human nature of everybody around him. If you rely upon it, you're doomed. You will twist and distort God's plan. So in the light of this unpleasant disclosure, Paul seems to feel that not only has his opposition foolishly abandoned God's appointed mode of salvation and ethical behavior found in the arrival of God in Christ, so they've, they've walked away from God's solution to the problem of salvation and ethics, And they have turned confidently back to the efforts of a fundamentally twisted human nature, thereby entering into a double bind. I think these countervailing concerns of Paul and the teacher are apparent in the scriptural texts that we just noted, which compete subtly in the argument of Romans, Galatians, and Philippians. Remember, the opposition to Paul, centered on the teacher, is banking on salvation through its own righteous activity arising from a human nature ostensibly trimmed by circumcision and tutored by the Torah. So Paul opposes to this optimistic proto-Pelagianism a devastating set of correlative objections. He will rely not on his own righteousness, but on God's righteousness, which in context means the divine monarch's salvation of his people from their extremity by way of Christ. Moreover, this salvation will save sinners, the ungodly, not the godly and the righteous. Um, A group that Paul is very skeptical will produce righteousness themselves, even after a wholehearted embrace of the teacher's pedagogy. So Paul's protest is framed by God's saving act and human depravity, both of which counter the teacher's reliance on his own Rectitude. I mean, am, am I wrong? Is this not a permanent discussion within the church? We constantly go back to, oh, surely God didn't give us absolutely everything that we need in Christ. We need to add a bit, just a little bit. Surely I'm not as bad as all of this makes out. Yes, you are. Don't add anything, and you are that bad, okay? All of which is to say that something of a battle for the Bible is going on in Romans between two opposed and very different positions. A battle that anticipates, in many key respects, the struggles between Augustine and Pelagius and some of Calvin's interpreters and Arminius. Scriptural texts are flashing across this battlefield unleashed by both sides. And the saving righteousness of God, the compassionate divine king who delivers his struggling and sinful subjects from their oppression, is Paul's scriptural discourse that opposes a Jewish Christian teacher overly confident in his own righteousness, as one of his probable key texts indicates reasonably clearly. That's Leviticus 18.5. The one who does these things will live by means of them. That in isolation from everything else that helps you to do things is a very confident text. If you're banking on that text to live, good luck. All right. I suggest, yeah, one final thing, one final thing before I turn to the verb. I suggest in deliverance that Paul is especially assertive and confident about all this because it has happened. The Old Testament appeals for God's intervention have been definitively answered. Moreover, the semantic space that they map out and anticipate has been filled with quite specific, concrete content. And that fulfillment is, of course, the resurrection, ascension, and heavenly enthronement of Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. This is the decisive, saving, life-giving act of the divine monarch, the resurrection and enthronement of his chosen and appointed son as anointed one and king. Now, it shouldn't be too controversial to suggest that the Kaiosune Theu and Paul, and quite a lot else besides, has explicit Christological content, put a little bit more colloquially, that this phrase is infused with a sense of resurrection, that its meaning really is eschatological, that Christ's rising from the dead is the actual point in space and time where God's definitive salvation is revealed and affected. But scholars have been slow to grasp this. And the failure to do so has led to an unfortunate Christological understatement in some accounts of Paul's subsequent argument. Nevertheless, I suggest, of course, we reverse this negative spiral if it's operative and recover the degree to which Christ informs all of Paul's language and argumentation in his Dikaio texts. Uh, Christ isn't playing a bit part here in a broader drama. He's not a Rosencrantz. He's not even a Polonius. 
He is the Prince of Denmark. We need to get hold of that. If we fail to grasp this, I worry we fail to grasp Paul's at, uh, argument at a fundamental level. Okay. Let me just say, if we do that, if we get the fact that it's got Christological content, one of the, one of the nice things is we can have Paul talking about Jesus from the start of Romans right through the middle and to the end. We don't have a puzzling gap in the argument where he suddenly drops out of view. Christ is in play in 1, 16 and 17. Okay, let's, let's move to the verb and I'll be brief. Yeah, this is a little shorter. Um, our realizations in relation to the noun phrase lead us to suspect that similar considerations are in play in relation to the cognate verb. It's dynamic, saving, and its content can be articulated most decisively by consideration of the eternal evidence. Perhaps more controversially, we're also invited to consider it in relation to Christ himself. The result of these considerations, I would suggest, is a recognition of the importance of Romans 6 7, which is something that E.P. Sanders saw very clearly. Basically, I'm going to talk about Romans 6 7 for a few minutes, and that's where I'm going to make my case. Wonderful text. Uh, I really think this matters. Hogar apothenon, dedicatai apotes hamatias. Translated by the NRSV, for whoever has died is freed from sin. Now, there's something really interesting. There's a major concession in that translation and a major blunder. Okay? The major concession is that dedikaiotai, the perfect tense of dikaiotai, has been translated without any reference to justification, vindication, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the major blunder is it's been generalized, whoever, uh, which I think makes nonsense of the text. What I would want to say is we must read this text Christologically in context, so the one who has died and who has been set free from sin is Jesus himself, so this is a reference to the resurrection. So the dikaio must be functioning in relation to the resurrection. The verb dikaio denotes the all-important transfer of Christ beyond death to the new resurrected realm. And it is this that opens up the possibility of our transfer as well, as symbolized by our baptism. And we can now see how strongly Paul's Christological use of the verb links up with the language of resurrection and life. Uh, it's all about resurrection, this language. That's what it's about. And why is it about resurrection for Paul? Because he's so deeply involved with Jesus Christ who has been resurrected. Okay? A strictly forensic sense, which would be the sense I'm opposing, I would argue makes very little sense. That would be a two-figure drama in which God presides as a judge over a transgressing individual, sin being an act of the individual and death an act of God. I conclude, at least for the moment, that when Paul is informed directly by his Christology, he uses the verb dikaio in an overtly liberative and even resurrecting way, and it would not be unfair to call this apocalyptic. But how do we explain the stunning usage in Romans 6, 7 in the broader context of Paul's writings? And because I've, I've got a problem now. Uh, and the problem is Romans 2. Perhaps most clearly in Romans 2, 13, the context suggests as directly as 6-7 that dikaio denotes, in this place, someone is being declared righteous in the full ethical sense, meaning that God is judging this person to be righteous and therefore pronouncing a judgment in relation to, to her of this. Certain important consequences following. For it is not the hearers of Torah who will be righteous before God, but the doers of Torah will be declared Righteous. This is a thoroughly tridentine use of the verb. And what is going on? Well, it seems that at least two quite distinguishable reference exist for the same signifier. Now, this is not a big problem. Signifiers activate different meanings all the time. Words are not immutable, simple ent entities. They're parts of complex systems. But does Paul's double usage go too far? Can we explain it? I think we can. This is my final kind of set of claims. If we pay, uh, we can, particularly if we pay careful attention to Romans 2. If we pay careful attention to the verses just preceding verse 13, we see that the process of judgment being described, it has two components, not one, but two. We forget this. As Paul says in verse 6, God apodotes 
hekesto katata erga aftu. He will give to each according to his or her works, indicating a process of evaluation of works followed by a process of giving, which actually dominates the discussion. Those who have evil works get given some pretty bad stuff. Wrath, rage, suffering, constriction, crushing, while those who persist faithfully in good works will receive things like glory, honor, peace, eternal life. And at this point, we can see existing Western assumptions may perhaps have tripped us up again. Commentators have generally ignored the way in which this divine judgment is not just an indicative action indicating a state, evil or righteous, but performative. That is, this divine act of judgment does not merely evaluate things, but it affects things, very important things. It is a speech act. Um, when a particular word is uttered by the relevant authority figure, someone gets condemned or set free. And when this is taken into account, we can see a way forward in relation to Paul's double usage, although we're going to have to talk a little bit about presuppositions. Now, modern Western readers tend to assume any forensic speech act is situated within a, within a process of discovery and evaluation and impartial judgment, like a modern courtroom or a court case. And this is probably because modern Western politics assumes forensic activity is fundamentally indicative in terms of Western justice, proportional, retributive. But narratives of rationality and justice interweave with accounts of politics and history and ethics. So the forensic speech act that is a verdict will almost certainly suggest for modern Western readers an indicative as well as a performative act. And it will be indicative in terms of Western justice. It will operate in a fundamentally legal sense, which will be thoroughly and utterly conditional. It'll be hard for us to think of this in any other way. And this Western discourse, it's not alien to ancient contexts. It can't be presupposed there universally in the way that it can more readily, readily uh, assumed in Western modernity, but its underlying metaphors and narrative were present, and Romans 2 participates within this particular discourse, as does its construal of the verb dikaio. In this setting, within this broader story, including all its accounts of justice and politics and human capacity and morality, Dikaio denotes a forensic speech act that is both indicative and performative. Indeed, the indication generates the appropriate correlated effect. Good deeds, eternal life, wicked deeds, anger and destruction. But we know well by now, I hope, that Paul is utterly opposed to any account of salvation, any gospel couched in such terms. Such a gospel is simply wrong all the way across and all the way down. Paul's Christologically mediated narrative supplies a fundamentally different account of salvation at every point, a different account of God, of Christ, of Christ's unconditional saving activity, of justice, of rightness, of sin, of humanity, and so on. But we've already talked about this quite a bit. So suffice it here to say that any account of the gospel in the terms just described is a foundationless projection of a particular human analogy into the being of God, and hence a fundamentally Aryan project. Did I just rejoin the Aryan Brotherhood? I did tonight, yes. Aryan, fundamentally Aryan project. It will be attractive precisely because it is a projection of a certain justice and politics into the being of God, especially for those unaware that that projection is taking place, or, or indeed for those benefiting politically from that projection. But it will be a projection, and hence an idolatry. And now we have an answer to our question. Why is the verb used in these two ways? It seems that the verb dikaio played an important role in the quasi-Pelagian system of the teacher, where in accordance with that discourse's broader dynamics, it's a particular speech act, a divine verdict, with indicative and performative dimensions. Indeed, the teacher's discourse basically converges on this future moment of evaluation before God on the day of judgment. And doubtless he hopes the contemplation of the two basic possibilities of that day 
will lead to strenuous ethical activity to try to lay hold of one of them and avoid the other. A little anxiety often leads to increased effort, he might say, even if, Paul would doubtless reply, the price paid for this is radical soteriological insecurity along with ethical self-deception. But Paul has not left things at this pass. One of his specific counter moves seems to have been the reclamation of the verb dikaio for his own system. And it is precisely its performative dimension that allows him to do this, along with the failure of most ancient forensic systems to be based on anything that approached what we modern secularists would call justice. We must remember this. Ancient, quote, justice, unquote, systems, very unlike our modern settings. We need to go back into that power-laden, arbitrary, possessive, and distorted situation uh, to get hold of how cynical people could be about justice. Okay, so this is my final, my final claim. I'm using speech act theory, obviously, to make a move. A verdict is a speech act in relation to a figure, but numerous situations existed in ancient times in which a speech act was not made with reference to that figure's ethical standing. A particular command by a figure in power could simply lead either to a figure's death or to her release. Simple as that. John the Baptist is languishing in the fortress of Machaira. Herod Antipas is foolishly cornered at a symposium, drunkenly into giving a command. He's executed. Judgment gets carried out. It's not based on John's righteousness. It's not indicative. It's a performative, though. He's dead. Uh, yeah, a judgment was carried out. It's not based on John's righteousness. It was rooted in Herod's turpitude. Analogously, but rather differently, Paul holds that humanity has been set free from its imprisonment within sin because of the character and command of God. The divine king has had compassion on his people and their suffering and has delivered them, and this is all to the good, because they can't deliver themselves or appeal for deliverance on any grounds of their own. Given their oppression, they are unrighteous and incapacitated. They are in prison. They must simply be set free, and God does so with a word of command. This, then, is where the verb dikaio functions in Paul's broader account of the gospel as seen in 6-7. Hence, although it is emphatically not an indicative action, it is a performative one. The critical outcomes it affects are still affected. God commands... Humanity is released from its confinement and given new life. It is forensic in the strictly controlled sense that the speech act terminates a ghastly imprisonment and sets a subject free. Here, the human race, as, humans, uh, as Romans 6-7 seems to suggest quite directly, the one who has died and been resurrected has been set free from sin. And so I was dumping on the Methodists early on, wasn't I? So I'm going to finish by quoting from Charles Wesley in an act of repentance. I think Charles Wesley has arguably captured Paul's meaning exactly in the famous Methodist hymn, which I think is an awful tune, but I really like the words, okay? You probably know it. And can it be that I should gain? And can it be? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. It's a little deep for me now. <laughs> I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That is as good an account of the meaning of DKIO and Paul as one could wish for. Um, as Douglas said at the start, we're delighted to have Scott Haferman uh, with us, who's made the trip from Aberdeen. Uh, Scott has, uh, St. St. Andrews, of course. Uh, Scott, <laughs> Freudian. Um, <clears throat> Scott has uh, recently moved to St. Andrews from Gordon Conwell College. Um, Scott is a well-known um, Pauline scholar and has written several monographs in the area of Paul. He's also known as a, a kind of mediator of German approaches to Paul in relation to the English-speaking scholarship, and he is responsible for 
uh, translating uh, what I regard as a very important commentary on, uh, on Romans by uh, Peter Stolmacher. So uh, thank you, Scott, and uh, look forward to your response. Thank you. I wasn't going to say this, but now that he mentioned Stuhlmacher, I will, because uh, responding to Doug's paper on righteousness is really helpful for me, be forcing me again to try to think through what I think about this hard topic, and it takes me back to my very first serious conversation with Professor Stuhlmacher when he was uh, in the process of becoming my doctor father at the University of Tübingen. And I had been schooled in various approaches to the righteousness of God, and I was all ready to impress him with what I knew. And we were sitting down in his living room, and he said a few things about the righteousness of God. And I didn't understand at that point yet, I'd only been in Germany a few months, that I wasn't supposed to say anything back. I was just supposed to be listening. And uh, so when he made a pause, I jumped in with all my American exuberance and gave him about it, I don't know, I'm sure he thought it was an eternity. I thought it was a very brief exposition of what, everything I knew about the righteousness of God. After which he looked at me and said, uh, Mr. Haifman, you don't know anything about the righteousness of God. Go back and study for a while, and then we'll have this conversation again, which I thought was helpful. So <laughs> now we're, uh, I, I feel like I'm back there one more time. And... Uh, I'm ready for Doug to say, go back and study a while. We can have this conversation again. Because this is a complex text and problem and issue. So here's my two cents, and I'm really glad to be able to be here today and share it with you, and especially for being able to, to work through Doug's work. Maybe just one little footnote. A year ago, how I first got introduced to Doug's work was that I had a, a a brave group of 15 students, and I asked them if they were willing to read 20 pages a day and get together with me and discuss it. And uh, they said yes. Of course, they would get credit for it. Um, and so we read 20 pages of Doug's book a day, six days a week, for a little over 10 and a half weeks, and uh, worked our way through those, you know, 1,100 pages and with these students, and that was a great experience. And it led me to conclude in the end that theologically we ought to agree with Doug's concern to combat all Western contractualism, which is so congenial to modern thought and culture, but presupposes and masks, really, an anthropology that, as we've heard today, is Aryan and Pelagian, an anthropology which is an essentially anonymous individual setting off on a quest for salvation driven and governed by her own conceptions. Page one. Campbell's own resistance movement to this Western contractualism is based on his conviction that this Western contractualism can be countered once we reject a forward construal of the argument of Romans 1 through 3, as we've heard this weekend, and resist its, quote, virulent conditionality within Paul, page one including especially, quote, a conditional account of Paul's discussions of faith and a corresponding retribution justice reading of Paul's dikaio terms. So there it is, conditionality, faith, and righteousness. How do you bring those together? Concerning this latter topic, then, the righteousness of God, Campbell rightly points out that in keeping with dikaio sunethu as a subset of all descriptions of being, we must keep in mind that being is, quote, fundamentally active and dynamic. I agree. So that we should resist any dichotomy between being and act or activity. A, quote, dynamic understanding of ontology further underscores an essentially subjective reading of the genitive, dikao sunethu, since, quote, any reference to a divine attribute or aspect of being must be a reference simultaneously to divine activity and hence to something both inherent in and proceeding from God. End quote, page three. The same holds true for ontological dynamism, the dynamism of human dikaiosune, which likewise, quote, must be an ongoing dynamic state of right behavior and activity. Page four. So in turning to the texts themselves, Doug's proper emphasis on the decisive role of internal contextual evidence, 
in order to overcome the lexical fallacy of etymologizing, leads him to conclude in deliverance that the dikau sune thuu is an event. It is singular, it is saving, it is liberating, it is life-giving, it is eschatological, it is resurrecting. This aligns, as he pointed out, with Kazemon's conclusion that the righteousness of God is, quote, God's sovereignty over the world, revealing itself eschatologically in Jesus, leading to a saving gift with the characteristics also of a power. Pages 5 and 6, quoting, of course, Kazemon. At this point, I would suggest that a small but eventually significant observation needs to be made about Doug's adaptation of Kazemon's work. Given Doug's own emphasis on ontological dynamism, it is equally important, I think, not to collapse being into activity. Righteousness is saving, it is liberating, etc. In other words, we ought not to say that righteous, the righteousness of God is an event or power lest the dynamism between being and activity be destroyed or replaced with a beingless monoism or monism. I think monism is the way theologians would say it. Sorry, monism. Kazemann's definition exhibits this danger. It is important to stress, rather, that the righteousness of God is not a reference to activity per se. It is a description of God's character as expressed in, inextricably so, expressed in saving, life-giving, eschatological acts of deliverance that reveal both God's sovereignty and his power, which in turn then can be evaluated as a characteristic of God's being in view of God's right actions. That is to say, dikau sune thuu is an abstraction, albeit linked to activity. As Campbell himself points out, the use of dikau sune in reference to God, quote, often seems to have a connotation of rightness, another abstraction. God is righteous because, as the expression of his being, he does what is right. This becomes important in view of scriptural context, the scriptural context that Doug rightfully points us to. These scriptural contexts in the Pauline context that deal with the righteousness of God. So here I want to join the battle for the Bible. Paul's use of Psalm 98 or 97 in the Septuagint in Romans 117, completely convinced by Doug's argument, points to the significance of this organic unity of, but distinction between being act and activity. As Doug helpfully points out, Paul is relying on the psalm of divine kingship in which God displays his sovereignty as king by delivering his people. The distinction, however, between God's character as king and the expression thereof makes it possible, I would argue, to do justice to the expression of God's righteous kingship, not only in terms of his saving behaviors, but also in terms of his judgment of the wicked as the corollary to his rescue of the righteous. Kramer's classic study pointed in the right direction, but it failed to incorporate the entire scope of God's being action, leading to a one-sided interpretation of God's righteousness only in terms of its salvific action that is, to this day, typical of German scholarship. Though I didn't know you were going to say that about me being a mediator of this, but it's true when you read the Germans. Indeed, as Campbell points out, it is right for the king to save his people when they are in extremity. But there is a strong, albeit secondary, emphasis in the biblical tradition, as it was also secondary in Paul, but there in Paul as well, I think, that it is also right for the king to judge those in rebellion against his rightful authority. Both are equally ethical actions. Both are demanded by the underlying relationship with his people that exists in accord with the king's responsibilities. As the inclusio to the revelation of God's righteousness in saving his people in Psalm 98, verses 2 and 3, with which the psalm starts, the psalm ends in verse 9, not with the Lord coming to save his people, but with the Lord equally coming to judge Crino, the inhabited world, and Dikaiosune, and the peoples in it, in justice. 
en uthuteti. It does not seem possible to limit this divine judgment at the end of the psalm only to God's salvific actions on behalf of his people. Rather, in order to deliver his people, I think the argument of the psalm says, God must judge the nations, an action which is equally righteous and just. So against this scriptural backdrop, the distinction between but unity of God's righteous being and his righteous acts makes it possible to take the gar of Romans 1.18 seriously as a ground for the argument of the revelation of God's righteousness in 1.16 and 17. And here I wonder, just, just a wondering, whether Paul in Romans 1.16 to 18 isn't following the flow of the argument of Psalm 98 itself, which moves from the saving righteousness of God in 97, 98, 2, to 97, 98, 9, to judgment. In other words, could the move from Romans 1, 17 to 1, 18 just be simply following the move in the psalm itself from redemption in verse 2 to judgment in verse 9? Question mark. Secondly, Doug derives God's right action from God's underlying kingship, his underlying identity as king, qua king. Let me say that again. Doug derives God's right action from God's underlying identity as a king, qua king, and from the, quote, nature of the underlying relationship with God's people that this kingship entails which he can then parallel in part with the role of a contemporary business executive on pages 8 and 9. As he summarizes it, quote, the story of divine kingship that Paul evokes establishes the righteousness of God's saving action in its own terms. Emphasis mine. It must be asked, however, whether biblically and precisely in Psalm 98, This relationship between God as king and his people is presented as intrinsic to God as a divine king or whether it is established extrinsically with Israel as a contingent particular consequence of God's covenant actions. And here I would just say amen to your emphasis on the particularity of God's relationship with Israel that you emphasized uh, eloquently yesterday. In other words... In Psalm 97, or 98, God acts to make known his salvation before the peoples by mightily saving his people, by which he reveals his righteousness as a result of the fact that, here's how the argument goes, God remembered his mercy to Jacob and his truth to the house of Israel. In deliverance, Doug could affirm in regard to divine kingship in general that covenantal associations of divine faithfulness are clearly not far away, and any such reading is not far from the truth, so that covenant, a covenant context is possibly found also in relationship to the righteousness of God. Nevertheless, he goes on, such covenantal associations, associations are possible but not necessary semantic resonances of the phrase dikaiosune thu. And as you saw in his paper today, covenant is there, but not there very strongly. In fact, Campbell asserts in deliverance that, quote, in the immediate location of Romans 1, 16 to 17, and its particular allusion to Psalm 98, I see nothing that activates such specific resonances explicitly, end quote. I see everything activating explicit covenant resonances. Far from being possible, the collocation of the motifs of remembrance, mercy and truth, Jacob and the house of Israel is overwhelmingly covenantal, I would suggest. In fact, the Septuagintal rendering of mercy and truth picks up, as you know, this this virtually stereotypical formula that's all over the covenant texts of the Old Testament, namely chesed ve'emunah. And this chesed ve'emunah unfortunately gets translated in the Septuagint faithfulness as truth, but you have to think truthfulness to God's covenant commitments. That's what you have to think, I, I would suggest when you read the Septuagint, if truth is rendering emunah. In other words, what obligates God is not the fact that he is a king per se, 
but the fact that he is a king over Israel as a result of his own particular specific covenant creating and covenant sustaining actions in fulfillment of his covenant promises to the patriarchs. It is not kingship qua kingship, but the revealed covenant that provides the key explanatory concept canonically for Paul's understanding of righteousness. God is not simply a divine king. He is Israel's king because of the covenant he has enacted based on his acts of deliverance as recounted in the historical prologues of the covenant texts, as Alan kept pointing us back to Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who shook out of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Therefore, implied, here's the Ten Commandments, you know, and Book of the Covenant, Holiness Code, etc. Interestingly enough, scholars don't often point out, Pauline scholars don't point out, that the same movement from covenant prologue to covenant stipulation is also right at the heart of the Abrahamic text in Genesis 15, where we know the text, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. But how many know the very next verse, Genesis 15, 7? which grounds why Abraham is to have faith in God as his shield and not give his uh, covenant blessing, his patriarchal blessing, his birthright blessing to Eleazar. How many know 15.7? Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. Why? Because God declares in the next verse, I am the Lord who took you out of Ur. So that the covenant prologue of 15.7 in the Torah anticipates the covenant prologue of Exodus 20, both leading to the covenant stipulations, which can be decoded in terms of the faith of Abraham or the obedience of the Decalogue. They function exactly the same rhetorically. Indeed, biblical material is unique in this regard. The scriptures are the only texts, archaeologists tell us, Old Testament people have affirmed, they're the only texts in the entire ancient world in which the concept of covenant was applied to a deity in relationship to his people. In every other ancient text, covenant is always and only used of earthly kings. Only in the Bible is it used of God. To look to God as a king then is extremely and inherently a covenantal act. This ancient covenant framework explains why, as Doug rightly observes, that in the world of Israel, king and judge were one person. So we must not separate or reject a covenantal notion of righteousness with its forensic implications from the righteousness of God expressed in the apocalyptic acts of deliverance. God acts as king covenantally to deliver his people in accordance with his judgments in regard to his people and against those who oppress them. So I would reverse Doug's emphasis in which for Paul the discourse of kingship is primary dictating the shape of any covenant in play. I would say it's the other way around. As an apostle of the Messiah, Paul conceives of himself as a servant of the new covenant, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. And he develops his argument in 2 Corinthians 3 in a old covenant, new covenant contrast. And 2 Corinthians 3 functions as a hinge between Galatians and Romans. Remember, he wrote Romans from Corinth shortly after he had written 2 Corinthians 3. So too, Paul's passing on of the seminal traditions concerning the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 5, our earliest, as you know, tradition of the gospel, must be held together, I would suggest, with his previous reference to the same passing on of tradition, remember the paradidomi verb, the passing on of tradition, that technical term occurs in 1 Corinthians 15, but it also occurs back in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul passes on another tradition, namely the tradition of the new covenant embodied in the Lord's Supper. Both these texts, the earliest proclamation of the gospel, has within its very heart conditionality by which you are saved if you hold it firm unless you have believed in vain. And of course, in 1 Corinthians 11, when he passes on the tradition, the whole purpose is to support why it is that some of the Corinthians are sick and some have died because given their mistreatment of one another, what they're doing at the Lord's Supper can't even be called the Lord's Supper anymore. They have broken the covenant. Covenant. 
Because of Doug's diminishing of covenant as a key explanatory concept for Paul's theology of divine kingship and hence his treatment of the righteousness of God in Paul, I think he seems to lapse into the same kind of natural theology that he so rightly rejects as part of the traditional justification paradigm. The sinner and the sinful nation do not appeal to God's righteousness for help because they are sinners, qua sinners, to a God who is a king, qua king, banking on the fact that it is naturally right for God as such to help sinful people. No, people have no inherent claim on God's mercy. This is made clear by Psalm 143, which Doug again helpfully points out is quoted in Galatians 2.16 and Romans 3.20. Here, too, the sinner's appeal for mercy is based on the fact that God's specific covenant acts and concomitant commitments, the promises of God, made to Abraham way back when, and hence of this particular sinful nation, are inextricably bound up with this one people, unlike any other people. So, the psalmist can emphasize that he cries for help and mercy because he is God's slave. Don't enter into judgment, metatu dulu, sue with your servant. And therefore, he can appeal to God's righteousness, which is again paralleled to God's truthfulness. Again, God's covenant faithfulness. Thank you the Hebrew backdrop, because, of course, God's reputation is now inextricably linked up with this sinner who calls upon God alone. In short, in the words of Psalm 142, verse 10, the sinner confidently calls upon God to teach him to do God's will because you are my God. And the parallel within Psalm 142, 11 then makes clear that God's righteousness is explicitly defined as God's concern for his own name, his own reputation as the Lord, the maintaining of which, by answering the sinner's cry, is thus in essential accord with God's truthfulness. Psalm 143, then, like the righteousness of God in Paul, is part of a larger motif in which God's righteousness is expressed in his never-changing commitment to remain faithful or true to his own covenant commitments. And these commitments center on helping those who humbly rely on him alone as their king, here expressed in the prayer of Psalm 142. The unconditionality of God's gracious acts as king and the conditionality of his people's response of faith, therefore, are not in conflict. The former both creates and sustains, not merely calls for, the latter. Every aspect of the covenant relationship, the covenant prologue, the covenant stipulations, and the covenant blessings and curses, every aspect of the covenant relationship is apocalyptic. There is no conflict between the two because the covenant is not at any point a synergistic contract between equals. As Doug himself has insightfully pointed out in Deliverance, this emphasis counters so much of the new perspective, which has simply shifted legalism from getting in to staying in. But all legalisms in relationship to God are to be rejected, including any optimistic, nomistic Pelagianism by Paul's opponents or anybody else. So in dealing with faith as a conditional response to the unconditional redemption of God, this Stress on the organic unity between being and activity can be of great help when we deal with something like the obedience of faith, in which obedience is the lead noun and faith is the qualifier. So that when Paul returns to the obedience of faith in Romans 15, verses 16 to 18, to describe his ministry, he can simply talk about obedience without even mentioning faith. Of course, in order to avoid slipping back into any kind of synergism in dealing with Paul's apostolic goal of creating covenant keepers among Gentiles, we must bring in at this point the determinative role of the Spirit, which despite Doug's own rejection of Calvinism as the privileging of faith as a direct gift of God 
thereby attributing salvation directly to God, which he doesn't like. I find it helpful that Doug does emphasize the determining role of the Spirit throughout deliverance as the antidote. Well, if I had more time, I could talk about the implications of this for reading Romans 2, which I think picks up Paul's argument in Romans 6 and 7 and 8. But let me just close by saying, Doug declares that, quote, we know well by now that Paul is utterly opposed to any account of salvation, that is, to any gospel couched in these terms of conditionality. That is to say, in large measure, in the terms that I suggest are at the heart of Paul's gospel. Such a gospel, in Doug's view, is simply wrong all the way across and all the way down. But I'm not convinced yet, because to corroborate Romans 2.13 as Pauline from a parallel context, it is Paul's fear of Christ's retributive judgment in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that drives him to beg the Corinthians to be reconciled to God based on the cross. For the same cross of Christ creates the new eschatological life of the new creation that lives for Christ in anticipation of the day of judgment. Rather than being a Jew or Gentile as defined by this age, what matters is a new creation. That is to say, a new life of faith that expresses its own nature in love as the fulfillment of the law, which can also be manifest in the keeping of God's commandments. Paul is not afraid, in fact, underscores a judgment by works because his Gentiles in Christ become covenant keepers and thereby are vindicated and justified on the day of judgment. So here, too, we see God's apocalyptic work of establishing the new creation decoded in terms of the realities of the new covenant. Unconditionality creating the keeping of covenant conditions. In deliverance, Doug himself makes this point in regard to the conditionality expressed in Galatians 5.5, which sets up this passage in which love is the fulfillment of the law as the expression of the new creation and anticipates the keeping of the commandments of God as the decoding of the fulfillment of the law in 1 Corinthians 7.19. Of course, I'm simply matching my reading of Paul as a paradigm against Doug's. In the end, then, Doug's work can be evaluated only by reading both the whole and its parts from a counter direction to the one he suggests to see whether one fits better than the other. One of Doug's greatest values, there are many, but one of Doug's greatest values is that it, he forces us to do this, just this, just this. In other words, read the whole thing again. Read all of Paul. Try to fit it all together instead of simply taking old answers for granted. I've learned a lot from Doug's work. But I think that the way to combat Western contractualism and to preserve the coherence of Paul's letters is to replace a contractual view of the divine human relationship, not with an exclusive apocalyptic participatory eschatology, but with a recovery of the biblical category of an apocalyptically understood covenant relationship with God the relationship covenantally between God and his people, and through this covenant relationship, a covenant relationship between God and his world. Thank you. Well, thank you, Scott, so much. There's a very provocative and subtle paper. Um, Let me say what I think is going on here. This is a salvation historical stealth attack, (laughs) all right? Guilty as charged. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I'm so grateful that you've done this because the conversation in my book is primarily with um, these contractual figures, kind of standard individualist justification paradigm. And the other conversation partners that one has to converse with at some point are the salvation historicists, the salvation historicizers, folk like yourself. And um, you and I, we have to have this. We have to have this discussion sometime. So let's have a bit of it now. Uh, let me position myself clearly. I'm absolutely with you in terms of an emphatic emphasis on one single covenantal act. Uh, by God, one, one, 
actually with a covenantal characterization of the relationship between God and the cosmos and humanity. But here's my problem. Uh, it seems to me that to give a coherent account of the covenant and one that's really stable, um, we, have to, we have to do it apocalyptically, i.e., we have to know what the covenant is, what its origin, instrument, and telos is uh, because of Christ. He is the one who gives us definitive accent, uh, access into its actual nature. So we learn from him what the covenant is all about. Now, if we control that insight by using, if we control our covenantal language using that insight, it seems to me we're starting in the right place and ending up in the right place, and we'll say the right things about the covenant. And I want to argue and defend the position that that is a very solid covenantal account of Paul. We won't be using the language that he uses because he doesn't use diatheke in precisely that way. He tends to use a pangalia, ekloge, and things like that. But we're saying the same thing. We're basically saying the same thing in dogmatic terms. That's where I want to go. What you're doing is a little bit different from me. You're inserting a prior construction of Israel's history which emphasizes an Ikrod type. I mean, I'm not reducing you to Ikrod, although I, I do like Ikrod. But you're inserting into the kind of lexicographical roadmap uh, and also the narrative roadmap a prior understanding of Israel's history in terms of covenant, which are that you're then pulling through into this terminology. So you're actually pressing through these texts, through the Caius and Otheu, quite a lot more information that's coming out of this, this broader narrative. And um, I've, got, I've got two questions for you. One, one is this. Can you really justify bringing in the, this kind of locomotive of intertextuality uh, in 116 and 17? I'm being just a little more economic than that. I think Paul's alluding to a couple of verses that are then comprehensible lexicographically in terms of the broader discourse. I don't think that there's a whole theology being mobilized through these signifiers. Now, I, I'm a little worried about that because I think I like the theology that you're mobilizing, but sometimes I don't <laughs> like what the theology that's mobilized through words. And, and once we kind of open the door to that, I think that's a problem. Here's my second problem, or my second question. I think that Paul's use of the Caiosunotheo is explicitly Christological, and you didn't mention Christ in any of your key moves. Um, in 3.25 and 26, Paul says, the endaxis of God's dikaiosune uh, is Jesus. So the definitive proof, and therefore the definitive content of dikaiosune theo is Jesus Christ. So if you can pull all this kind of beautiful orchestration of Old Testament covenantalism through that Christological lens, then you and I are on exactly the same page. <laughs> and I think we probably are. I think uh, I take most of what you're doing as a series of kind of friendly amendments. Would that be right? <laughs> so I really don't think we're very far apart. But really, so what I'm pressing you on is, is Christology. I, slight misunderstanding, too. This is my final point. Um, the Caius Sunothe, when I push back on the covenantal move there, I'm not saying that I don't like the covenant as, a, as part of the narrative that's being evoked by Dikaios Sunothe. I'm quite happy with that. I'm saying that the meaning of Dikaios Sunothe is not covenant faithfulness. Now, we know some people, we have mutual friends that think that. But I actually think they're wrong. I think the Caiusinotheu is a saving act. I don't think it's God's covenant faithfulness. That's not what the word means when it's used. So all these covenantal associations that you've, you've pulled through so nicely, they're actually, le they're actually syntactical associations of the signifier in the Old Testament. They're part of the story, not of the lexicography. So it's a, it's a methodological point, but it's, it's subtle in terms of what eventually happens in the Pauline text. But I, I just thought that was terrific. I really enjoyed it, and I love the way this salvation historical challenge is, is such a powerful one. It's very powerful. It's very persuasive. I'm tempted by it daily. I'm, 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 not, I'm not giving it just yet. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Doug, for your kind response. For the first time, I get to say this on his native soil. I think C.H. Dodd was right. <laughs> that uh, I think he was wrong with some of his over-realized over eschatology. But I think he was right in this kind of classic old statement that every reference, virtually every reference, that Paul makes to an Old Testament text is a footnote to a larger context. 
Um, that has to be demonstrated, of course. Yes. And one of the places where Doug and I then disagree is when you go back to a text like Psalm 98 or Psalm 143 or Habakkuk, you know, 2-4, how far do you go back? Was Paul proof texting or was he signaling the context from which these individual texts come? I go with the signaling the context view, and I know that always leads me to the danger of maximalizing and overreading Paul, and I have to be aware of that. Um, but that's just a, a fundamental different point we have methodologically. You're sort of a minimalist, and I'm sort of a maximalist, in, if you could yes. put it that way. Yep. Right, right. That's what I have to be. That's right. And, and the echoes thing, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because uh, Prof Professor Hayes' work has been really, really influential to signal all these echoes. But of course, he thinks in the end, Paul does strange and wonderfully weird things with the text. Mm -hmm. And I think Paul usually does very sober and contextual kinds of things with the text. Right. But that, I mean, that would just be another methodological. Can I just Please. speak in the voice of Richard Hayes yeah. momentarily. Yeah. <laughs> he, he would argue it's Christological. That's right. And that, yeah, that, and exactly brings to your second good point. If I didn't men mention Christ, um, it's only because I was really working on these narrow texts that you were that you were referring to. Of course, I think it's Christological. Even for Paul, take away his Jewish backdrop, even communicating to his new hearers who didn't share his Jewish background, every time he mentions the word Christ, he's got explaining to do. Christ is in it of itself an inherently covenantal and an inherently history of redemption title, not a name. And to know, I can remember the first time I, I started reading the Bible with a Hindu who didn't have any backdrop, he came from Delhi, no backdrop with the text. What in the world does the word Christ mean? Why do you call him Jesus Christ? Is it like Fred Schwartz? Is that his last name? Well, no, it's not a name, it's a title. What does it mean? Oh, boy, does that take a lot of Old Testament explanation. So I would argue that, that history of redemption is all over the place, essentially in the title, Jesus is the Messiah, and as the Messiah, he's the Lord of the nations. But I would also suggest, and here you and I might differ, I I really do think Paul read the Old Testament. I'm saying this cheeky, I shouldn't, but I'm already into the sentence. I can't get out. I think Paul read the Old Testament all the time before Damascus Road. And so his understanding of covenant and the history of Israel is something he brings with him when he encounters, when Jesus encounters him, rather, on the road to Damascus. So he is... Yes, it's Christological as the fulfillment of the history of redemption, but I don't think Jesus transforms Paul's understanding of the history of redemption into something else. I think Paul sees it all leading up to Jesus being the Messiah and as the Messiah, the Lord of the nations. And I see, therefore, the fulfillment motif implicit in, in a lot of this Christological stuff. One good example would be, I think, Paul's standing by, you mentioned Paul the violent man, Paul standing by the stoning of Stephen, if we take the account of Acts uh, seriously there, and I do think it's, it's historical there. He's standing by, why? Because he thinks Jesus has gotten just what he deserves, and Stephen's getting just what he deserves for propagating this heresy of a crucified Messiah, because everybody knows, according to Deuteronomy 21-23, that God curses publicly false prophets and false teachers by hanging them on a tree so the people will know not to follow them. So the curse of the law from Deuteronomy 21, 23 fell rightly on Jesus as a messianic pretender and on all of those who were propagating his heresy and therefore we ought to arrest them as well. Wonderfully then in Galatians 3, 13, what does Paul do with Deuteronomy 21, 23? Yes, there's the curse of the law and it doesn't fall on us anymore because it did fall on Jesus. So I would argue that the, the um, move Paul's making there is, is coming out of the cognitive dissonance he had on the road to Damascus. How can it be that Jesus is cursed by God on the cross and now vindicated by God in resurrected glory? Answer, he died not for his own sins but for the sins of his people. 
And so now we have to realign Deuteronomy 21, 23. It's still there in the history of redemption, but now it gets applied to us through Christ. So I love your emphasis on Jesus, though I don't think Habakkuk 2, 4 is all about Jesus. Um, so that's the last thing. What about Habakkuk? What ab right, that's a big thing, right? I mean, what, what's Habakkuk 2, 4 doing in Romans 1, 17? And that we'll have to do after coffee, but yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you.